Good evening, everyone. It is so wonderful to be here with all of you as um, we talk about what it means to get older. Um, I am delighted to have my mentor and teacher, and if I may be so bold to call her a friend, Rabbi Laura Geller, to talk to talk with us this evening and to share her book, Getting Good at Getting Older. Uh, Rabbi Geller uh, and I met when I was in rabbinical school. She as the third rabbi, uh, female rabbi to be ordained by the reform movement uh, was leading one of the congregations where I attended services regularly, on, especially on Shabbat morning, uh, led a really wonderful minion uh, which I have taken as inspiration for our Shabbat morning minion um, in terms of her teaching and her leadership uh, and has over the years been a mentor to me as well. I'm putting her full bio into the chat um, so that you can read it, but it should also be noted that Rabbi Geller is uh, one of was named one of the 50 influencers in aging um, that through this work that she is doing she has really become a leader in what it means to age well and so with that I will turn it over to her to uh, share a little bit about herself and about the book. Are we going to start with uh, that text? That, okay, we can start with that text. Did you want us in breakout rooms or did you want me to just put it up? I think just put it up and we'll talk about it together. Okay. Let me just make sure that I've got it up. Okay, so I'm going to begin looking at a ancient Jewish text from Pirkei Avot, a little tractate of the Mishnah that is usually translated as the sayings of the fathers or the sayings of the ancestors, but probably is better translated as essential teachings. It's from about the second century. So I'm gonna read it um, in the interest of time. Um, he used to say, at five years of age, the study of scripture, at 10, the study of Mishnah, at 13, subject to the commandments, at 15, the study of Talmud, at 18, the bridal canopy, at 20, for pursuit of livelihood, at 30, the peak of strength, at 40, wisdom, at 50, able to give counsel, at 60, for zikna, at 70, for seva, at 80, the age of strength, at 90, a bent body, at 100, as good as dead and gone completely out of the world. So the first thing I want to say is, although our birthday blessing is you should live to be 120, ad meave esrim, apparently we don't actually mean that. Um, and actually, I've heard a lovely reframing of that. Instead of saying ad meave esrim, you should live to be 120, People are now saying, ad mea ka esrim. You should live to 100 as though you were still 20. Energetic, active, you know, but living to 120, I'm not so sure we want to wish that on anybody. So there are two words in here I didn't translate. At 60 for zikna. What does zikna mean? It usually is translated as old age. Um, Zaken means beard, so it has something to do with being old enough to grow a beard. This already tells us who the audience for this is. <laughs> it isn't me, but uh, maybe it's my cousin Eddie, right? This is uh, directed to men, not to women, right? Uh, zikna, but one of the uh, rabbinic interpretations of zikna is zeh shekone chokma, one who has acquired wisdom. So at 60, for one who has acquired wisdom. At 70, for seva. What does seva mean? Usually it's translated as 
white hair, hoary hair, whatever that means. Um, I like the translation, the fullness of age. And those of you who know Psalm 92, some, a psalm that we often say on Shabbos morning, the words are, the righteous will blossom like a date palm. They will still be fruitful in seva, in the fullness of age. They will be full of sap and still juicy. So at least in the second century, this was a kind of fantasy notion of what a life cycle was. So I want to take a few minutes together and ask you what surprises you in this Jewish vision of a life? And what's the work of each of the stages? So um, Rabbi Gorbin is going to uh, look at all of you. And uh, if you have thoughts about it, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and uh, she'll unmute you. What surprises you? What's the work of each of these stages? And Rabbi Gorbin, if you can lift up to the next page, I break down the stages a little more. Okay, so you see there seem to be four stages. What is the what surprises you and what is the work of each of the stages? Surprises that in the second century, wait, I saw somebody, people were projected to live 70, 80, 90 years. Remember, this is probably more of a fantasy than a reality, but yeah, this is a fantasy vision of what a life would be like. Clearly, people didn't normally live that long. What else surprises you, or what is the work of each of these stages? Frank? Okay, uh, uh, that so early in life, we had so many responsibilities. Uh -huh. I mean, I was uh, 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 30, uh, 32 when I got married, uh -huh. and here 18, so I'm almost double. Right, that's interesting. Huh. Good, what else surprises you? The, the Well, what you were talking about the, before, the contemplation of, of life, it, when you're 60, 70, 80, I mean, people didn't live that long, or very few people lived that long. So, I mean, it was it was not like the, the group that's here tonight, uh, that most of us are in our 60s and 70s, and uh, uh, most of us here are, are basically still good health, like you were talking about, that you should live to 100 and be like you're 20. Uh, I yesterday was supposed to have returned from uh, skiing in Colorado. Well, Didn't go, but uh, nice. that was very uh, nice. Yes. Okay. Somebody else. What's the work of each of these stages? So I, I, I see something that I think is omitted and because it's, there's nowhere where you're, t you're supposed to be teaching. I, giving counsel to me is different than okay. teaching. So I think that's kind of a glaring omission. Okay, let's hold on to that idea. What is the work of the first stage? Five years study of scripture, 10 the study of Mishnah, 13 subject to the commandments. This, by the way, is where um, the bar mitzvah notion gets, right? At 13, we are old enough to be responsible for the commandments. At 15, the study of Talmud. What is the work of the first stage of our life, according to them? Learning. Learning, okay. So the early stage- Here's Daisy. <laughs> the early stages of a life is learning. Yes. What is the work of the second stage? At 18, the bridal canopy, 20 for pursuit of livelihood, 30, the peak of strength. What's that about? The way you live your life. The more, more, specific, more specifically, what is that about? Um, somebody who hasn't spoken? To have a productive life. What is a productive life? Well, having a family, family yeah. and providing for them, family and career, right? Okay. So the first stage of life is learning. The second stage of life is building a family and a career. And then at 40, what, what starts to shift? What happens in this third stage of life? You actually have knowledge. You actually have knowledge, life experience. And what does that enable you to do? Enables you to teach. 
It enables you right? to They're kind of saying you learn all the way up until 50 and then flips around and you teach. Okay. And what else do you do? You teach, you, what, how do they characterize this stage? Maybe it's strength of character. You build your character. I'm not so sure it's building character. It seems to be more about giving back. Yeah. And how do we give back? Through the wisdom that we have experienced. Now, Abraham J Joshua Heschel, famous uh, theologian of the last century, perhaps the most famous, uh, said that um, just because you get older doesn't mean you're wise. On the other hand, there is something about getting older that is connected to wisdom that wisdom has something to do with life experience and being able to reflect on that life experience. So if we were to divide this, these three sections, the first stage of our life is about learning, the second about building careers and families, the third beginning to give back, accumulating or, or reflecting on the wisdom that we have, being able to give counsel, um, uh, someone who has acquired wisdom, fullness of life at 80 the age of strength anything surprising about that those of you who are in your 70s you can look forward to 80 being the age of strength right that uh, um, skiing trip to uh, Vail, right um, probably anybody who made it to be that old in those days clearly with somebody what 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 are, what are they meaning by strength are they meaning strength as, you, as you're defining it right now i i would guess yes but we don't really know um the word is gavura which means you know like male strength you know you see a strong guy and you say hey, he's a giver who you know what a strong one he is but i actually think it probably has something to do with if you made it to that stage um you know that was a sign of strength even today, they say, I mean, the older you are, the older they expect you to live. Okay, so that's, it's interesting, right? And then the fourth stage at 90, a bent body at 100, as good as dead. What is the work of that fourth stage? Looks like letting go. Letting go. Okay, so um, how would our description be different? If you were to think about your life, how would you characterize the first stage, the second stage, the third stage? For me, I think I go through the different stages at different stages so that I repeat. In other words, it's just not one and I'm 57. It's not just one, two, three, and four. It's one, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, two, three in different stages. Judy, I think that's a really interesting insight. Why do we think that you can only learn when you're a kid? You know, why is college only for people between the age of 18 and 21? I mean, I actually have more time now and probably would take learning more seriously than I did when I was uh, that kind of a adolescent, right? I mean, so it's interesting to imagine our lives in stages and to recognize that how we think about stages in a way is socially constructed. Um, and so that's where I want to um, move to as I begin to um, share with you some of um, my thoughts about uh, getting good at getting older. So we can take this off the screen. Um, it's important for us to know that we in this life stage that we're in, people roughly between the ages of 60, late 50s, 60s, to maybe the middle 80s, healthy late 80s, people like us are living 30 years longer than our grandparents did. 30 years longer. And those 30 years are not tacked on to the end of our lives. It's not that we're going to be frail old agers 30 years longer than our grandparents did. It's that there's something in between midlife, when we built our careers and raised our families, 
and frail old age. And that is a new stage that didn't exist for our grandparents. So before we actually look at that, I want to ask you, what do you call yourself? You that are in this life stage that I just described. What's a word that you use? Um, somebody want to put it in the chat? And Rabbi Gorbin, can you read the chat? Um, I'm having trouble seeing it. I will read the chat. What, what do you call yourself? How many of you like the word senior? Raise your hand. Do you like to be called senior? Somebody See a lot of heads. A lot of yes or a lot of no's? No's. Okay, can somebody who said no explain why and maybe someone who said yes explain why? I said no because maybe denial, but maybe 57, you know, listen, I don't get the uh, senior discounts at the movie theater yet and I'm not sure what else, but I, I put in the chat that I consider myself an empty nester. Okay, an empty nester is a good uh, word for this stage, uh, assuming that you had children that fill the nest um, and not all of us do. So it, you know, it works for some of us, but not for others of us. Good, what other words do you like? Somebody so likes the retired. word- Retired. Retired, again, works well for people that worked and doesn't work well for people who didn't work. Um, so what else? What other words would you use? How many of you like the word elder? Raise your hand. Rabbi Gorbin, can you ask someone who likes it to explain why? So I have don't see anyone who likes it, but if you did, then, oh, Nancy, go for it. I'd unmute myself first. <laughs> um, I like elder because as opposed to elderly, that there's a huge difference between the two of elder. Now it's six, almost 65. I don't consider myself elder yet. Although in amongst my coworkers, I am an elder, yes. Um, but I think elder connotes wisdom. Right, so the interesting that our religious tradition you know, gives honor to elders, right? And m many religious traditions do. You aspire to be an elder, a source of wisdom. And yet people don't like it because it sounds too close to elderly. So notice how hard it is for us to name this stage and therefore how hard it is to name ourselves. Some of us so are born, some of us were born between 1946 and 1964, but not all of us were. Some of us are retired, I said, and some of us never worked. So what are other words that you might want to use? Put them in the chat. So we have a couple of um, words here. We have encore with an exclamation point. Okay. Sometimes this generation is called the encore generation. Good. What else? Um, newlywed. <laughs> newlywed. That's lovely. Um, but again, not all of us in this stage are newlywed, right? Um, so again, it's interesting. I think we learned from Jewish feminism in the early years that if you can't name something, it's hard to get your hands around it. Um, how hard it is to name ourselves. Some think, people, go ahead, anybody else? Yeah, I think part of the issue is if you still have parents alive, you think of them as the elder, the senior, the whatever, and you're not taking those labels upon yourself yet. Okay, that's very interesting. And one of the things that is true for many of us is that we still have older parents or older people that we love, that we are in some kind of caregiving role to. And at the same time, we have millennial kids who also need our attention. You know, it used to be called the sandwich generation. And now I think it's called the panini generation because you're really squished between dealing with older parents and dealing with millennial kids. So just notice, I just want to call our attention to how difficult it is to name ourselves. Um, one word that I think is uh, um, good is active older adult. Um, I'm an older adult and I'm active, an active older adult. Um, the, third, the third chapter, um, 
But actually, my most favorite is a word that was coined by Dr. Laura Karstensen of the Stanford Center on Longevity. She calls us perennials. We're still blooming. Some years not so good, some years better, but still blooming. So I want to remind us all that we're not just talking about us on this Zoom call. We are creating a new life stage that never existed before. We are doing something that never happened before. And I said that life stage, you think that it's biological, but it's actually socially constructed. I'll give you an example. The word adolescence didn't exist until the 1920s. It was a stage of life that didn't exist until their you know, children did not immediately uh, go into the workforce, right? So in the 1920s, adolescence was invented or named. And similarly, this new life stage is something that we are creating. creating. And how we do this is very important because someday our millennial children or grandchildren, we have them, will be in this stage. And how we figure out what it means to be between midlife and frail old age in this active older adult stage until we teach our Jewish institutions how to respond to us in this life stage. It's going to be problematic for those that come after us to you know, create this, um, to make this stage a, a rich and, and nurturing part of their lives. This is not a, chronicle, a chronological age that we're talking about. It's really a life stage, again, between midlife and frail old age. And it's important to know that while we have a lot in common, we're different from each other. Some of us are healthy and still very active. Others wrestle with physical challenges, with disabilities, with illness, with caregiving. Some of us are parents of adult children. Some of us are grandparents. But some of us don't have kids or grandchildren or don't have the kinds of connections with them that we wish we had. Some of us are solo agers. Some of us have partners. Some of us are straight and some of us are LGBTQ. Some of us have discretionary resources and some of us worry about financial future. It's important to notice that we have much in common, but we're still a diverse group. So we are reimagining a life stage. And as we do it, we're actually reimagining a lifespan as well. Demographers predict that children born since the year 2000 will be able to live to be 100. And children that are born in 2007 will live to be 104. But most of the policies in which we live were put in place for very different assumptions about the age of our populations. Life expectancy 5,000 years ago was apparently 18. In the early 1900s, life expectancy reached 47. <coughs> and it reached 77 at the end of the last century. Today it's 79 and it continues to increase. Dr. Karstensen, the woman who gave us the word perennials, says that it's time to get serious about a major redesign of life. In her view, the tension surrounding aging is due largely to the speed with which life expectancy increased. Long lives are not the problem. The problem is that we live in a culture designed for lives that are half as long as the ones that we have. Think about it, retirements that span four decades some of us will have that, but it's unattainable for most individuals who can afford it, and governments haven't really thought about it. And really, education that ends in the early 20s, not so suited anymore for longer working lives, or for the truth that learning is a lifelong process. And the social norms that dictate intergenerational responsibilities are changing as well. So a few years ago, the Stanford Center on Longevity launched an initiative called the New Map of Life that brings together experts, including engineers, climate scientists, pediatricians, mm -hmm. geriatricians, behavioral scientists, financial experts, biologists, educators, healthcare providers, human resource consultants, and philanthropists 
to envision what vibrant century long lives would look like, and then to begin the remapping process. How do traditional models of education, of work, of lifestyles, of social relationships, of financial planning, healthcare, early childhood and intergenerational compacts, how do all of those um, models need to change to support the kinds of lives that all of us might well be living? This is a really challenging question in the world in which we live, but also in our Jewish community. And so it's important for you all to recognize that we are pioneers at getting good, at getting older. So Rabbi Gorman, do you have some questions for me? Thank you. Well, I just wanted to um, catch Herb and Sharon who have had their hand raised for a while. Okay. Remember, I can't see whose hand. Yes, I know. I know. That's why I wanted to just get them in before we keep going. Are you able to unmute yourselves? You're right. Move on. Okay. So, um, so Rabbi Geller, you have put together this wonderful book, Getting Good at Getting Older. Um, for any of you who have ever used the Jewish catalog, this is along the same lines, not, um, I'm sure, very intentionally, given that um, Richard. Uh, Rabbi Geller's late husband and co-author was one of the contributors to the Jewish catalog. Um, and so can you just tell a little bit about what made you and Richard decide to write this book? Well, thank you. So almost 50 years ago, when I was an undergraduate, there was a revolution that was taking place in the Jewish world. I wasn't active in creating the revolution, but it's probably part of the reason that I ended up going to rabbinical school in 1971. That revolution was energized by the beginning of the Jewish countercultural, counterculture, and it was captured, as Rabbi Gorbin said, in a book that was modeled after the whole earth catalog. Some of you might remember it, and that was the Jewish catalog. So I'm going to hold it up. This is what the Jewish catalog looked like. Can you all see it? Yes? The introduction to it says, it empowered that generation of baby boomers to, quote, take back Judaism from the staid hands of our elders and reshape it for our own times. It was quite revolutionary because it offered the tools to take responsibility for our own Jewish lives. First time that there was a book like this. Uh, some of you might even have used the challah recipe in it the first time you ever tried to bake challah. And as Rabbi Gorbin said, that co-author of that book was my late husband, Richard Siegel. I didn't know him then, we got married years later, but that was Rich's first um, important contribution to the Jewish community. Well, that was the 60s and 70s. And now that some of us are in our 60s and 70s, Rich felt that we needed another do-it-yourself kit to help us navigate the changes that are part of our lives as we grow older. So that's the first origin story of this book, Getting Good at Getting Older. And as Rabbi Gorbin said, it looks just like the Jewish catalog, same color, same size, same kind of uh, um, design inside. Um, like the Jewish catalog, getting good at getting older is also a toolkit. And like the Jewish catalog, it has a sense of humor. The book includes irreverent cartoons and some photographs, including my favorite, which is the backside of Maxine Menster's tombstone in Iowa, which was a recipe for cookies. Apparently, every time someone asked for her cookie recipe, she would say, over my dead body. So let me tell you the second reason Rich and I wrote the book. I was 62, I'm 70 now, and Rich and I were beginning to think about our next stage, what would happen when we retired. And I noticed that a huge percentage of congregants at Temple Emanuel of Beverly Hills, where I was the senior rabbi, a huge percentage of them were boomers and many were leaving the congregation. That observation led to a listening campaign where we talked to about 250 congregants 
in-house meetings in people's homes facilitated by congregants. And we asked people how they feel about this stage of life, this stage between maturity, when they built their families and careers, and frail old age. We asked them, now that more years have been added to your life, how are you gonna add more life to your years? What keeps you up at night? What gets you up in the morning? And it turns out that people consistently had four fears. The first fear was becoming invisible. Who am I when I'm no longer the senior rabbi of Temple Emmanuel of Beverly Hills? The second fear was being isolated. Our social capital shrinks as we get older, we're not working anymore, work colleagues don't return calls the way they used to. A fear of being isolated and lonely. The third fear was the fear of being without purpose. Well, what am I going to do all day? And the fourth fear was the fear of being dependent. God forbid I should ever be dependent, especially on my children. People shared questions in these conversations. Questions like, how do I navigate changing relationships with my older parents, with millennial children, with intimate partners, and in particular with friends? Friends turned out to be a huge issue for people of this cohort. How do I nurture long-term connections with friends? How do I let go of toxic friendships? Now that I know I have less time ahead than I have did behind, do I still want to hang around people who suck energy from me? And then fear of loneliness, how do I make new friends? Another series of questions that relate to this, as friends move away, kids too, with whom do I want to grow old? And in what kind of settings? Do I want to move into a retirement community? Do I want to move to be near my kids? Do I want to age in place, stay in the home that I love? But in order to do that, what kinds of changes do I need to make in my community in order to be able to stay? Um, I'm now a widow. I live in a house that Richie and I lived in together. Do I want to have people move into the house and share the house with me? What would that be like? So those kinds of questions kept coming up. And just as an aside, one of the things that emerged out of these conversations is a kind of remarkable uh, partnership that exists between Temple Emmanuel Beverly Hills, my synagogue, and Temple Isaiah, a reform synagogue not far away, where um, two synagogues got together and created a village, a synagogue village, that both supports the synagogue and enables the kind of community so that I can stay in my house. I can stay in my house until I can no longer take out the barrels, you know, unless there's a neighbor who can come and take out my barrels. What do we need to do in our communities in order to make it possible for people like me to age in place? Um, and it's been a wonderful um, uh, experiment, which I'm happy to talk about when we get to questions. Other questions that kept coming up. How do I deal with illness, my own or that of my friends? There's no question that at other times in our lives, people get sick, but it's true that at this stage, more of our friends are getting sick and we're dealing with our own illness as well. I don't know about you, but I have a rule with my friends that when we get together virtually now or in, in person, uh, we can only do five minutes of the organ recital. What's the organ recital? Five minutes of talking about what's wrong with each of our organs, and then we move on to whatever else it is that we're going to talk about. Other kinds of questions. What do I need to do to get ready for the inevitable? Those end of life conversations that I know I need to be having with my adult kids, but if I don't have kids, with whom do I have them? Um, it was interesting at Emmanuel, we discovered that the majority of people had end of life directives, but a very small percentage had actually ever shared them with their adult children. And I'm sure that Rabbi Gorbin agrees with me. I've spent way too many hours in hospital rooms with um, a beloved or not so beloved mom or dad no longer able to articulate what he or she wants 
and adult children not being able to agree on what's best leads to all kinds of toxicity that uh, could easily be averted if people could have those conversations. Other kinds of issues. What will give meaning to my life now that I no longer work full time? How can I find a volunteer or a paid position to which I can bring my experience, my talent, my passion? I don't want to spend my time stuffing envelopes. I want to find an organization whose mission I really resonate with, but who knows how to use my experience in a way that can be helpful and also satisfying to me. And then this question, which I really uh, resonated with, what do I have to do now to become the 85 year old I someday hope to be? You know, the uh, when Harry met Sally scene where Estelle Reiner points and says, I want what she's having. Well, some of us are privileged to have older people in our lives. I want what they're having curiosity, energy, um, gratitude, um, patience, humor. Um, what do I have to do now? How can I work on myself now so that I have a chance of becoming that kind of an 85 year old? And how, do Jewish, how does Jewish wisdom and spiritual practice help me work on myself? Um, and another issue that kept coming up is well, what about celebrating the moments in this stage of our life? Um, what are those moments that deserve to be celebrated or mourned? How do we do that? How do we create ritual for this stage of our life? And finally, there are a lot of questions about legacy. What lives on after me? And the uh, bad thing that emerged from all these conversations is that we discovered that our kids don't want our stuff. What are we going to do with all of that stuff? So those were the questions that became the table of contents for the book, Getting Good at Getting Older. There are six sections. The first is Getting Good at Gaining Wisdom. The second, Getting Good at Getting Along. The third, Getting Good at Getting Better. The fourth, Getting Good at Getting Ready. The fifth, Getting Good at Giving Back. And the sixth, Getting Good at Giving Away. Each section offers actual tools and resources that will help you find your own answers to those questions. It's not a book that you read from cover to cover. It's a book that you pick up at a moment when you're trying to deal with, okay, it's time for me to have that conversation with my adult kids. How do I have that conversation? Or it's time for me to think about my funeral. How do I plan a funeral? What are the kinds of questions that I should be asking? Um, we wrote most of it, Rich and I, but some of the chapters were written by people who knew more than we about some of these issues. So you'll notice that there are chapters that are written by experts in the field. So that is the story of why Rich and I wrote Getting Good at Getting Old. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I am wondering, especially knowing that the book was very timely also, not just as you were planning it, um, but also in your own lives um, with Rich getting sick and then dying, um, how that impacted the, the book and, and its ultimate um, form. It would have been a much better book if he had lived to, uh, to finish the book. He died before the book actually came out, but, but still was able to, you know, frame the structure. And uh, the poignant part of it is that uh, there's a chapter that he wrote called uh, From the Land of the Sick. And he began writing it when he was completely healthy. And um, in the middle of the writing, um, two years into it, actually, he got the diagnosis of cancer. And although we didn't know for sure that it was terminal, there was a good chance um, and so he finished writing that article when he knew that he was dying. Um, what was uh, a blessing about um, having worked on the book together is that all of the issues that you need to talk about before somebody you love is going to die, we had talked about without any sense that either one of us were going to die. You know, all of those issues about funerals, about end of life issues, about conversations with our kids, about legacy about um, everything we had been able to talk about. And so um, although Richie died way too soon, um, he uh, died a month before his 71st birthday. Um, it was a good death because 
there was nothing that should have been said that hadn't already have been said. Do you think that it would have come out differently had you not gone through that experience? You know, the truth is that um, some uh, some sections were put in after he died. I mean, we didn't we were not going to deal with mourning because there are a lot of wonderful books about mourning. Um, so we didn't need to rewrite those books. But I realized that I did need to write about um, what it would be like for me to be able to acknowledge the preciousness of that relationship, but at the same time, figure out what it means to move on. That was a chapter that wasn't going to be in the book. And of course, the introduction is different than it would have been. Um, you know, so um, listen, there are a lot of ways the book would be different um, if we were if I were writing it now. Um, one of the ways it would be different, not in terms of rich, but in terms of the pandemic. Um, you know, the book came out before any of us could have imagined the world that we're living in now. Uh, and the book would be different and knowing what we have learned through the pandemic. So how would that have been, how would the pandemic have changed the book? So ironically, because of the pandemic, all the issues that are part of our lives turn out to be more urgent than ever. And the first is ageism. We don't really write directly about ageism. I think we would have knowing what we know now. You know, ageism, as you know, is the only acceptable ism in our society, right? You're allowed to have negative stereotypes about older people. Um, I mean, it's ter terrible, but I mean, nice people do have negative stereotypes about older people. And ageism manifests itself in pervasive employment discrimination and biased health care and media caricatures and in the invisibility that so many older adults feel. Um, and um, what's the problem isn't just societal ageism, but it's internalized ageism the negative stereotypes that we have of ourselves. Uh, a lot of us say 70 is the new 50. And when you think about it, that's just kind of denial. You know, it's a way of saying we're not really getting older. But now because of the pandemic, even those of us who denied that we were getting older, well, we can't anymore because now, as all of you know, it's actually a frightening time to be an older adult, frightening because we are particularly vulnerable. And the other thing that has changed or has been lifted up because of the pandemic is that stereotypes and ageist attitudes about boomers persist and in some ways have worsened. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was a meme, hashtag boomer remover, which revealed this horrible attitude among some that it didn't matter if active older adults were dying. Um, and, you know, there's generational tension. Younger people blame us boomers for the sad state of our country. Um, and, um, you know, for us, you know, my life is still pretty good. I mean, I'm not worried about a job anymore. I still have um, resources, but um, for younger people, the country that we're leaving them, their futures look much more bleak. And so there's tension between the generations. But yet at the very same time, there's a, this is a new intergenerational mo moment. The higher vulnerability of those of us over 60 has confronted our adult children with perhaps their first serious encounter with health challenges that we and their grandparents face. You know, and until now, our attempts to stay and act young, it delayed the arrival of concerns that we maybe ought to have had about health and slowing down, but now it's our kids that worry about us. And, and um, now some of us are acknowledging our own internalized ageism. Some of us are beginning to admit because of the pandemic that we might need help, right? I couldn't have made it through uh, through the first couple of months of the pandemic if Richie's daughter, my stepdaughter, hadn't shopped for me, you know, when I was afraid to go shopping. So we need each other in a way that we didn't know we needed each other before. And there are important conversations that now we know we should be having with our adult children. That's new. At the same time, many adult kids have moved back to their parents' homes sometimes bringing grandchildren with them. The value and possibilities of intergenerational connections have never been more clear. As Jews, we often think about intergenerational connections as Lador Vador from generation to generation, 
But now we realize that it's really door by door, generations with generations. And how do we capitalize on that new reality to imagine different kinds of multi-generational possibilities after the pandemic is over? If I were writing the book now, that would be a big part of the book. The third is the increased focus on loneliness and isolation in our age cohort, which as all of us know is only made worse by sheltering at home. We know that loneliness and social isolation can be as damaging to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And the problem is particularly acute among us and older people. Two in five Americans report that they sometimes or always feel that their social relationships are not meaningful. And one in five say they feel lonely or socially isolated. A lack of connection can have life-threatening consequences and we feel it more because of the pandemic. I don't have to tell you the, the studies that link chronic loneliness to dementia, depression, anxiety, self-harm, heart, heart conditions, and substance abuse. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about, but in the interest of time, I think we all know that that's true. Um, all of this was true before the pandemic, but it is more obvious to people now leading to a conversation that we should have been having in a much more robust way. You know that in the United Kingdom, I think under Thatcher's rule, uh, there was a minister of loneliness appointed. Somebody like a cabinet position whose job it was to figure out how to deal with social policy to that could respond and could mitigate the real challenges of loneliness. The fourth issue, and here again would have been a big chapter in the book, is the importance of technology. None of us could have survived this pandemic without this technology that has been so life-sustaining. And yet, we all know that it's a double-edged sword. Um, there's some evidence of a loneliness paradox. It was actually on NPR this morning. Um, tech and social media that should make us more socially connected actually increases loneliness. Um, what are we going to do when this pandemic is over and we live in a hybrid world? We're never going back to the way things were before the pandemic. How are we going to figure out ways to use technology to connect us in a hybrid world? So those are some of the things, the, some of the ways that the pandemic has um, raised up these issues and how the book would be different if uh, I were writing it now. I, I think there's one other thing that you could add to that, and that is uh, uh, sort of our, our bucket list of things that we were planning on doing. And are we going to be able to do it that it's going to be a year or two years further on in our aging? Right. So I think that's a really good point. I mean, what, you know, what have you learned from this? What is really important to you? And as we move into a post pandemic, but not, you know, the, to a new normal, whatever that's going to look like, what will our priorities be? Um, I think those are really, really important questions. Are there any other questions? You're welcome to put them into the chat or at this point to unmute yourself and ask. Let me just take a minute and say one of the things that I learned is that Jewish tradition really does have wisdom as we negotiate this stage of life. And for me, this is um, very much connected to the power of ritual. If you think about it, Jewish life cycle rituals are clustered in the first part of our lives. A baby is born, there's a breed or a covenant ceremony. Maybe there's a pidyon and haben, a redemption of the firstborn child, a bar mitzvah, a bat mitzvah, a confirmation, a wedding, for some people then a divorce. Um, what is the life cycle ritual that happens after your wedding, anybody? Again, I can't see. Anybody have a thought? Well, it, it's death, unless you it's want to do death. an anniversary of your B'nai Mitzvah. It's death. <laughs> oh, the seven Shemi Brachas. Is that what you're talking about? No, I am talking about in a traditional notion of a Jewish life cycle ceremonies, after a wedding, the next life cycle ceremony is your funeral. And it's really amazing when you think about it, because I, God willing, am going to live more years between my first wedding and my funeral than between when I was born and I was first married. 
Now, why is that? The traditional answer would be, well, you don't need new life cycle rituals because you're going through them again with your children and grandchildren. And I think that's true for some people, but of course you have to have children and grandchildren for that to be the case. But the question is, if we believe as Jewish tradition does, that divinity, however you understand it, is present at any moment, and what, you, what we need to do as Jews is to notice that there's something bigger than we are. That's why we say a hundred blessings a day. We stop a hundred times a day and say, wow, this apple that I'm eating, wow, you know, it didn't grow in bonds. It grew on a tree. Somebody picked it. Somebody brought it to the market. So, you know, you pay attention. You say, wow, that's what a blessing is. And that's also what a life cycle ceremony is, a transition from one stage of life to another. So the question for us in this stage of our life is what are the moments of transition and how do we want to honor them? We're going to read just a brief um, section from the book um, and notice that what I'm reading is not Jewish necessarily. Um, this is um, written by a congregant, uh, Temple Emanuel. Saying goodbye to the house where you raised your children isn't easy, but it's easier if you actually say goodbye. Our daughter, her boyfriend, my husband and I walk through the rooms of our home, stopping in each one to share good memories and to honor the room for its service. After our journey through time, space, and love, we shed a few tears, toasted the house, and sent it on its way to shelter and protect a new family. Before this ritual, we were stuck, painfully holding on to the house we had built 27 years before when our daughter was born. But after the ritual, we felt joy and contentment as we realized how rich those years had been and how ready we were to let go and move on. An unforeseen benefit is that our daughter's boyfriend now feels more connected to the life and history of our family and says he can't wait to be part of the new memories we make together in our condo. We can't wait either. So you see, um, that's an example of, um, of a new ritual that could give meaning to um, what's a very difficult time, you know, downsizing, moving out. Um, I had a congregant who called me at one point on her way to dismantle the home that she had grown up in. She and her brother were driving there and they said, Rabbi, what's the prayer that you say when you dismantle your parents' home? And I said, yes, there should be a prayer. What is the prayer that you should say? So we made up a prayer and that experience changed what was, what they were viewing as a chore into a sacred experience. So the question that the book asks without giving you answers is what are those moments in your life? So somebody suggested, you know, an adult bar about mitzvah or a, um, a, a recommitment of um, wedding vows, or, um, you know, there are lots of different moments. What might some of those moments be? Um, an example um, that I'm really uh, curious about is, at least in Los Angeles, I don't know about Pittsburgh, when a person can't drive anymore or when they shouldn't be driving anymore, giving up keys is a really difficult moment. It's a moment of loss, a moment of shame. People hang on to driving a lot past the time that might be safe for them to do it. Um, what would happen if we could imagine, if your synagogue could imagine, for example, a ceremony marking the wisdom of people who are wise enough to decide that um, it's time to give up the keys. They become, they are, are rewarded with some kind of no, you know, title or notice or ceremony or whatever. And then what would happen is then the synagogue, it's on the synagogue to help them figure out how to get how to get around, right? I mean, if I can't drive anymore and I still want to come to Shul, then it's up to all of you to figure out how to get me to Shul. So the community then becomes involved in the um, life cycle um, ceremony that, you know, could be um, so important to the individuals and also to the community. So all of this, I think, is, is really interesting. Um, thoughts? I'm seeing some of the... Um, Comments? I was just thinking about how uh, my grandmother made herself feel better about giving up her car by giving it to my cousin um, who was not able to afford a car on her own. And this was an opportunity for her 
um, both to, to recognize, for my grandmother to recognize what she was um, no longer safe doing and also to use it to um, support her grandchild and also great grandchildren uh, by doing that. So I'm looking at some of the chat, I can see them now. Um, let's see, my kids have asked me for some of my stuff as well as my parents stuff so they can have memories of family, that's lovely. For example, they want my records. Um, so that's great if your kids do want your stuff, but a lot of us not only have stuff that our kids don't want, but we have stuff that we had from our parents or grandparents in our house, right? I mean, so what do you do about that? Well, there's a chapter in the book about downsizing that actually gives you ways to think about that. Um, and, um, you know, is that a moment for ritual or not? I mean, what would that look like? Um, uh, the hardest part, somebody says, is... Uh, um, my son is worrying about me. Yes, our kids worry about us, right? We need help. We don't want to admit it, but the pandemic has made it clear. And I think one of the secrets of getting good at getting older relates to that last fear that people had. God forbid I should ever be dependent. Well, the truth is we're always dependent from the time we're little babies through our whole life. And we're also independent a lot of times through our whole life. And I think the secret to getting good at getting older, at least one of the secrets, is figuring out a way to be interdependent. How to create a kind of mutual nurturing interdependence. And for those of us who are lucky enough to be in multi-generational settings, and a synagogue, by the way, is one of the few multi-generational institutions that still exist, how to create that kind of interdependence so that all of us at no matter what age, you know, can, um, can be part of a community that um, sees us, that um, connects us to each other and um, connects us to what transcends uh, ourselves as well. Thank you, that was, that was so beautiful. And I would love to open up for more questions or comments if there are. Um, and also recognizing that that's sort of a beautiful closure to, uh, to our talk this evening. Um, Rabbi Geller will be um, offering a workshop focused on her chapter on friendship um, and building friendships uh, next week at seven o'clock as well. And we can, um, other kinds of uh, leftover thoughts or our um, conversations we can work into the um, study group next week. Um, yes, so thank you all for being here this evening. And um, I have one last comment. Oh yes, um, by all means. The other thing that is a secret to getting good at getting older is um, having a sense of humor. Absolutely critical, right? So uh, don't, don't lose that. I said at the, in the middle of my talk that, uh, you know, we would say 70 is the new 50. So what I want to leave you with is the thought 70 is not the new 50. 70 is the new 70. And the way we do this, the way we are 70 or 75 or 80, the way we do this is really important, not just for us, but for the generations that are going to come after us. So you know, how we do this, how the group of people around this Zoom room and the people in this wonderful synagogue that you have, how you work on some of these issues together matters, not just for you, but to the whole Jewish community. By the way, that's why I'm actually really insistent on always sharing my age when people ask, because I think it's so important to, um, to enjoy the blessings of any given age um, and, to, and that by owning it, we really get to sort of take away the power of that ageism, um, both in its discrimination against older people and its discrimination against younger people. Um, by the way, I look at my 95 year old grandmother and she's the one that I wanna be hmm. when I grow up. Well, get working on it now if you're not already, right? <laughs> um, so thank you, by the way, if you would like to buy the book, I put it in the chat a couple of times and I'll put it in again. You can get it on 
um, Amazon or um, Barnes and Noble or through the seller um, Berman House. Um, this is what the book looks like again. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you all very much for inviting me not only into your show, but